Hey guys, so this is the follow-up to the first anonymous survey with your realtor. Um, I put this out last week. It was just a survey posted out on Facebook and LinkedIn saying, hey, if you have questions for a realtor and you want them answered, I'll answer them for you. So we had a bunch of people ask their questions anonymously and um, I've got a little time here now, Sunday afternoon, the kids are all out of the house. This is their beautiful artwork in the background. So I thought I'd record uh, answers to your questions. So let's dive in, okay? Um, should I buy or sell first? Excellent question. There's no one answer because it depends on what your situation is. Now, if you can buy without selling, then you should buy first. Let me explain why. There's no point moving unless you're going to be happier with your next home. If you can't find something better than what you already have, you should stay put. And in today's market, a seller's market, it's it can be difficult to secure a house. So you should start by buying first. That way we can make sure we're getting exactly what you want and you can be where you want and where you need to be. Okay. Particularly because it can take some time. I have a couple buyers right now. They are putting in two, three, four offers before they're getting the house that they want because everything is multiple offers. Now, let's say you can't buy without selling. That's certainly going to be a, a problem because if there are eight offers on the table and two of them have a home sale contingency and the other six don't need to sell a house, well, they have a distinct advantage over you. What we can do in that situation is we can list your house for sale and then we get multiple offers. Let's say we get four, five, six offers and we go to the buyers and we say, hey, tell you what, we'll sell it to you, but we need you to wait 100 or 120 days until we settle or um, we'll settle in 60 days, but then we want you to lease it back to us for 60 days so we can go buy the next house. What we just did is we created an environment where your house is sold. You're now able to go buy. You don't have a home sale contingency, but you still have plenty of time to go find your next home. Um, so those are two very good options for people if they want to buy or sell first. Um, what I would say is if you have more questions about it, we just need to talk about your specific situation because there might be other options out there depending on what uh, your financial situation is, what kind of house you have, where you want to move, etc. That would give us a little bit more latitude. All right. So another one is how do you calculate return on investment on an investment property? All right. So I'm assuming this is referring to rental properties specifically, not flips. Some people use them interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. A flip is calculated very differently than a rental property. So if we're doing rental properties, um, I, I want to hit two things first. First, let's go with some like fundamentals. If you have a rental property and there's two units on them, each unit rents for $1,000 a month. That means your gross rent collected is $2,000 a month or $24,000 a year because I'm collecting $2,000 a month, 12 months, $24,000. So $24,000 gross income. Now you need to calculate what the operating expenses are of the property. So taxes, insurance, if there's vacancy rates or if there is um, repairs that we do on a regular basis, if you have to pay electric bills, if you have to pay a water bill, a sewer bill, whatever it is, calculate that all together. That's your operating expenses. That's what it costs you to operate this rental. So we make $24,000 a year. Let's assume there's $6,000 a year in terms of operating expenses. All right, that means I have a net operating income of $18,000. 24 minus six equals 18. Um, it's very similar to like a paycheck or like a W-2 or something like that. If you've ever seen it, you make your gross income, they take away your taxes, this is what you're left off with. That's your net income. Same concept except a rental property. Now the relationship between the net operating income and the purchase price is known as a capitalization rate and is your best metric for evaluating whether or not a multifamily property is a good price. Um, a simplistic metric, but the best metric if I had to pick just one. When we're doing the total return on investment though, this is where I say, hey, we got to bring in a couple other concepts. And you're going to say, well, what are the concepts there? Well, um, every month when I get that $2,000 check, a portion of that builds my equity. A portion of that goes to interest, which may be a tax write-off. Um, every month, my property may go up in value. Every month, I may be able to depreciate a little bit more of my property. When you add all those things in, oh, and every month I might have a little bit more cash that actually goes in my pocket. You know, after I'm done paying the mortgage, after I'm done paying all my expenses, I might make a couple hundred bucks a month. Who knows? 
When I start adding all those things in, that's when you get your real return on investment. And that's why you can see, you know, properties with 10, 15, 20 plus percent return on investment um, as a multifamily property because you're able to depreciate, you know, $30,000 this year. You're able to write off $10,000 worth of interest payments. You're building your equity to the tune of $5,000 per year, which is real money that you'll get. You just don't get it until you sell the property or until you try to leverage it into some other kind of line of credit or something. Um, and that's separate from the fact that on average, properties increase in value over time, otherwise known as appreciation. It doesn't guarantee that your $200,000 house will be worth $210,000 next year, but on average, it is. So we need to calculate all of that. And that is a little too in depth for this video. Um, but what I would say is I'll put together another video at some point, um, running through a couple examples where we calculate the actual equity we're building. Um, we can estimate the tax write-offs that you would get. We can show you how we would calculate the depreciation. We can show you, um, I don't like to estimate appreciation, increase in value of the property. I don't like to estimate it, but we can show you a place where you could write something in if you feel like that is a major contributor. And we can also show you how much cash you would make on an example property. And when we sum all that together, that's what your true return on investment is. So I apologize about being a little long-winded. There was a second question with this one as well that had to do with um, tax write-offs. Don't see it here in the list right now, but I do remember reading it. Um, if you're doing repairs to a rental property, so let's say you go in, you have a vacant building, and you spent 20 grand on that building, cleaning it up, making it nice, that's a tax write-off. If you have interest payments in your CPA or your accountant says you can write that off too, that's a write-off. Uh, that is a very individualized thing because some people max out their write-offs. The vast majority of us don't. Most people with rental properties do not. I mean, they use as many as they can, but they still have the opportunity for additional write-offs. That is one of the best parts of owning rental properties. Um, that you're able to reduce the amount of taxes that you ultimately need to pay in the end. So yes, it's not just the cash that comes off the property. That's a very small component of what a multifamily property can do for you. Okay, so uh, next question. What do I need to do to get my house ready for the market? Um, so I guess they, they want to sell their house. So there's three things um, that I think of when I talk about a house. So we've got the memory point. This is the sales feature, like the thing that everybody loves, like, oh, I've got this amazing kitchen with quartz countertops, soft closed cabinets, tile backsplash, everything, gorgeous view out into the backyard. That's amazing. That's fantastic. We want to highlight that and we want to focus on that because that's why somebody's going to buy your house. That's why somebody's going to fall in love with your house because they're going to see themselves building new memories there. They're going to see themselves celebrating Thanksgiving there. Um, the second thing is, you know, the least important. It's the forgettable stuff. Nobody cares about it. Um, every house has four walls and a ceiling. Great. Do you have four walls and a ceiling? Wonderful. Okay. As long as it's not unsightly or amazing, nobody cares. It's just there. And the third and probably the most important one from actually getting a sale is the red flags. These are the problem, Childs. These are the challenges associated with your property. Like there's something wrong with it. Like if you look at my back here, okay, uh, all right, maybe this isn't a great example, but it's a yellow wall. You know, I don't want everybody to walk through my house and say, oh, that was a house with yellow walls. Okay, if I want to sell my house, I'm going to paint the walls gray. We're going to paint the walls something a little bit more neutral, something a little bit more mainstream. Um, a better red flag might be, oh, uh, <laughs> if you have a house and there's mold in it, please clean up the mold. Make sure it's cleaned up properly. And I say that because you don't want to be the mold house. You don't want to be the house with... Uh, Carpet in the bathrooms, red flag, get the carpet out. It'll help sell the house, I promise. Um, and the reason I say those is, it, this sounds weird, but people are more afraid of red flags than they, fall, than they like positive things. I don't know if that makes sense. If I said, um, hey, uh, here's $10, or I said, hey, I'm gonna take $10, which one would you want? People don't wanna lose $10. They like getting $10, but they really don't wanna lose $10. And it's the same thing with houses. They really don't want to buy the junky house. They really are afraid of getting the one with mold in it or the one that's just a piece of garbage. They don't want that. So fix those red flags, focus on your memory points. Um, I think they were asking also like a general question or like some tips for things to do as you're prepping. I would just say focus on those red flags. When the time comes, we'll talk about doing like a deep clean on the property 
you know, staging the house, cleaning the counters, emptying the closets a little bit to make them appear larger and stuff like that. Next one, how do I petition my taxes? Great question. First thing I want to mention is be careful when you petition taxes. All you're really doing is opening up Pandora's box and saying, Mr. Tax Assessor, tell me whether or not my taxes should be higher, or lower, or the same. There's no guarantee that when you petition your taxes, your taxes will go down. They can, in fact, go up. But let's say, you know, everybody in the neighborhood has $5,000 a year in taxes. And you're at $8,000 for some reason. And all the houses are the same. So you say, well, this is unfair. I shouldn't be charged $8,000. Okay. Every year in August, there's paperwork that you can file with the assessor. And you can reach out to me and I can just pull all the paperwork for you, send it over so you can see it. You file, up, file the paperwork, you hand it in. And then you get ready for a hearing. Probably sometime between August and November, they'll invite you in for a hearing. You'll sit down and you'll say, here's my proof that my house is worth this and why you think your taxes should be lower. Um, if you want, you can hire an attorney and they can actually help you with the whole petition process or you can go do it yourself. It's your call. They'll review the information and what they'll often look for is like an appraisal to figure out what your real world value of the property is or if you have an agreement of sale because you recently bought the property, you can show them that and say, here, my house, you know, for whatever reason, you're taxing me like I'm a $600,000 house, but you can see here from this agreement of sale, I'm really a $400,000 house. Or you can see here from this local appraiser's report, I'm really a $400,000 house. Um, I think you should reduce my taxes. And they'll make the decision at that hearing what your new tax assessment will be, which determines what your new tax um, uh, bill will be. And uh, that's that. The other one that came up, uh, I don't have it written down on my list here, is water in the basement. What do we do? If there's water in the basement, you can never finish it, correct? Incorrect. There's a lot of things you can do to fix water in the basement. It really depends on what's causing it. But the two biggest ones, the most commonly um, seen problems, are downspouts and gutters or just the grade of the ground. Now, this is just my anecdotal evidence. You know, I'm not a basement water penetration guy, but... Um, I've talked to a bunch of them. So if you have water in your basement, first thing I want you to do is go outside of your house, look at your gutters and your downspouts, you know, where the rainwater comes down and see where they go. A lot of people, like a lot of people, their gutters go right down to the ground and drop tons and tons of water right next to their foundation. So yeah, I mean, if we got an inch worth of rain and you look at the size of your roof and you multiply that by an inch worth of rain and you dump that down in one quarter, that's a a lot of water all that water is going in there and it's very common for it to kind of like percolate into the house so that's number one if your if your basement's like six feet underground i would tell you make sure your gutter your downspouts go at least six feet away from it at least um that's not like some scientific thing that's just like a rule of thumb that i picked up over the years uh the second thing is the soil so uh you've got an exterior wall Ooh, that light's crazy you got an exterior wall there we go right? And this is the outside of the house. You don't want your soil, your, your ground level to be flat against the wall. You certainly don't want it to be sloped in towards the foundation. You want it to be sloped away. Why? Uh, I read a study from Penn State. It was crazy. It said something like 80 to 90% of rainwater when it hits the ground actually just runs off the ground. So that means that if my, my soil outside of my house is sloped away from the house, even if the downspout comes and drops a whole ton of water right here, most of it's sliding away, just keeps sliding away, right? And that's good, that's what we want because a, a foundation and a basement, the whole concept of it, it's like a pool in reverse. You're just trying to keep the water out of the pool. And so if I wanna keep the water out of the pool, I wanna keep the water away from the pool. Don't funnel it into your sump pit and then pump it away. Keep it outside of the house as much as possible and get it sloping away from the house so as it naturally goes into the soil and as it naturally hits the ground, it's all running away from your reverse pool. So hopefully that helps. If the video is um, informative or you have other questions, I'm going to leave the form open and I'll probably throw it in the comments below so you guys can ask questions and maybe we can do this on a regular basis if you guys find it helpful. If not, no problem. Hope you all are doing well and have a great day. Bye.